What would you do if suddenly you lost everything you love? At 23, Amy Morin suddenly lost her mother from a brain aneurysm. Her mother was seemingly healthy and happy and her death came as a complete total shock. A few years later, just around her mother's death's anniversary, she unexpectedly lost her 26-year-old husband from a heart attack. Fast forward four years, she recovered from her losses and remarried, only for her adored father-in-law to get diagnosed with terminal cancer. Amy faced a lot of emotional pain over the span of just a few years. To self-soothe, she started writing a list of things mentally strong people don't do as a reminder to herself that we can always choose to be mentally strong. Now she had a manual on habits to abandon if one wishes to have a productive and fulfilled life. What is it that makes some people resilient to life's misfortunes and others to gain a fearful attitude? 1. They don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. Self-pity is the most destructive habit one might have. Why is it a problem? It wastes our precious time and energy. It breeds more negative emotions, such as anger and resentment. Ultimately, self-pity is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let's take a look at Jack. After getting hit by the school bus, his legs got broken and his parents started overprotecting him. Jack started to withdraw and went from a happy child to an irritable one. Parents scheduled a session with a well-known child psychologist. She greeted him with, I've never met a kid who could beat up a school bus, which made him smile. Jack eventually opened up and wrote a book about a tough child who fought the school bus and triumphed. This is the power we have when we step out of a self-pity mode and reframe the way we look at our situation. How do we stop the self-pity party? Besides reframing, we can focus on other things through volunteering or acts of kindness. We can do something active like exercise or taking a new class. A strong antidote to self-pity is gratitude. Exercise through a gratitude journal or by naming things out loud we are grateful for, even if just to ourselves. Number two, they don't give away their power. Your close childhood friend wants to meet you every Thursday, one of your gym days. He's not into lifting and prefers meeting you over a calorie-laden dinner and a craft beer. You have a hard time turning him down, but over time you start resenting him and thinking obsessively how not cool it is for him to cut into your precious time. Your friend is now in your head 24-7 without having the slightest idea you are resenting him. We give our power away to others when we don't refuse unwelcome things, we don't stand up for ourselves, we don't set boundaries, and we lose our cool. How can we regain our power? By stop blaming and reacting to others. By acknowledging we always have a choice and using the language that reflects that, I choose to instead of I have to work, by practicing forgiveness. Number three, they don't shy away from change. The flow of life is ever changing. Don't imagine you can remain the status quo and stay stagnant. Things and people will change with or without your compliance. Why do we stay in bad relationships, jobs we dislike or bodies that make us unhappy? Amy believes it's because we are fear, discomfort, grief and risk avoidant. Each change has five stages. Pre-contemplation, in which we are unaware of our need to change, so we persist in our harmful habits. Two, contemplation. We wage the plus and minuses of potential change. Three, preparation. We make a plan and outline the steps necessary to kick off and persist in the new behaviour. Four, action. The act of actually doing the new behavioural pattern. Five, maintenance. Mapping out how we will stick to the new habit when hindrances occur. Becoming aware of our emotions, especially the negative ones, and planning changes are crucial elements of stepping into a new life. Number four, they don't focus on things they can't control. We inherently know that trying to control everything that comes our way may lead to a waste of our resources, time, energy and money. So why do we do it? Because it's an anxiety coping mechanism gone too far. In order to reduce our anxiety, we turn into control freaks, which only amplifies it. There are two main types of people, those with an internal and those with an external locus of control, both shaped by our childhoods and life experiences. The first type believes that they control their lives and they change things through effort. The second group ascribes them to a deity or fate, something external beyond their control. The ideal is the bi-local focus of control, which allows us to acknowledge our ability to act, but also recognises the external forces that influence us. If you like the sound of this book so far, you can get it for free with a trial of Audible using the link in the description. 
I highly, highly recommend Audible and personally use it all the time. Also, if you use the link in the description, it helps to support this channel. Number five, they don't worry about pleasing everyone. What could be wrong with being nice to people? People pleasing Amy writes about goes beyond that. It stems from negative emotions such as fear and discomfort. It can also be a learned behavior. Jason is an extreme case of a people pleaser. In his search for a stable relationship, he goes over and beyond to act and talk in a similar way to his dates. If the lady is a gym rat, he's into lifting. She's a food blogger, guess what? He's in the kitchen 24 seven. Plus he loves photography. The problem with pathological people pleasers is it comes off as disingenuous. People pick up on our insecurities and don't respect us as they would if we stood our ground on our preferences. Number six, they don't fear taking calculated risks. You've been waiting to launch a podcast, YouTube channel, or write an ebook since forever, but something always holds you back. Don't worry, the fear of reaching your full potential is more common than you think. When thinking about taking risk, we get flooded with negative emotions, memories of past failures, and we enter the what if territory. What if I'm not good enough? What if everyone at school or my job laughs at me? The best way of counteracting this? Planning ahead. Calculate the risk by asking yourself questions such as, will this matter in five years? What's the worst that can happen and how can I stop it? Also, practice taking small risks, often to toughen up. In the long term, the ability to take risks will improve the quality of your life immensely. Number seven, they don't dwell on the past. We've all been guilty of this, reminiscing and obsessing over ex-lovers or the time we got humiliated by a teacher. 20 years may pass, but in our heart, the wounds remain fresh. The world moves on, but we stay stuck in the past. When James was six, his older brother died in a skating accident. Their mother was grief struck and James tried everything he could to replace David. He would wear David's clothes trying to make his mother happy and started worshipping his dead brother. The death he experienced so early left a permanent psychological toll on him. Childlike innocence became his ideal. James became world famous as the author of the play Peter Pan or The Boy Who Couldn't Grow Up, which became a classic. However, today we know more about the dark origin of the character of Peter Pan. Number eight, they don't make the same mistakes over and over. Do you know someone who keeps gaining the same 30 pounds or someone who keeps dating the same type of person saying, I'm such a magnet for, we undeniably want the best for ourselves. We want to learn from past slip ups and do better next time. So why is it so often we don't? Because it's difficult to unlearn childhood acquired behaviors. Most of us learn to hide our mistakes instead of exposing them to the world and ruthlessly analyze them and learn from them. We are wired to stick to what is known, even when it's detrimental to us. A man whose girlfriend always cheats on him would be wise to question his attraction to that particular type. To combat this, we should acknowledge our responsibility for our mistakes, make a prevention plan on paper and identify cues that precede negative behavior. Number nine, they don't resent other people's mistakes. We are deeply ashamed to confess this emotion. We know being envious isn't cool, so we suppress it to the best of our abilities. We resent others because of our insecurities, sense of injustice, and because we don't know what we truly want. Resentment across all areas of our life harms our relationships and is time and energy consuming. To offset this emotion, we can change our external circumstance, behavior, or attitude. We can choose to cooperate with others instead of viewing them as competitors in a zero sum game. We can also figure out our own definition of success instead of chasing somebody else's. Number 10, they don't give up after the first failure. Failure is, more often than not, deeply painful. To protect ourselves from more hurt, we often nip the behavior that caused it in the bud. If we feel the failure is caused by lack of ability on our part, it can lead to learned helplessness. This mental state will condition us to never try to change our circumstances. The history is full of people who refuse to quit. Thomas Edison, Oprah Winfrey, Albert Einstein, J.K. Rowling, Michael Jordan are among some. Who's your favorite failure success story? Comment below. Number 11, they don't fear the alone time. Today's world is the pinnacle of interconnectedness. Being on our own, all quiet, without our phone, favorite TV show, podcast, or a book seems dreadful. What on earth should we do with ourselves? In the past, loners were often stigmatized and characterized as losers. We now know that alone time boosts creativity and productivity. No wonder so many artists isolate themselves in remote cottage houses when they have to deliver. Solitude increases one's empathy. Too much time in your social circle leads to an us-against-them mentality, leaving little comparison for anyone outside this circle. 
allot a certain time to simply be in silence. Learn more about meditation and mindfulness and get in touch with the core of yourself again. Number 12. They don't feel the world owes them anything. Sometimes we think we deserve more than others because we are better at something than others. We can work longer than anyone else, we are kinder, smarter than most and can connect the dots others miss. Or perhaps we had a difficult childhood. Our parents didn't encourage us or were abusive. Maybe we were bullied in school. It is only right the universe gives us something in exchange for all the suffering we endured. This prevents us from being grateful for what is good in our lives and turns us against others. The solution is to turn outward, not inward where the emotion started. To overcome the feeling the world owes us something, we can focus on helping others and becoming a team instead of a solo player. Number 13. They don't expect immediate results. The world today is all about instant gratification. 15 year olds becoming TikTok billionaires overnight. So what are you waiting for? The issue with I want it now mentality is we become unable to see the big picture. This is obvious when we don't invest part of our disposable income because we want to spend it on drinks or traveling. We forget what it means to do hard work and use shortcuts to reach our goal. Like when we take dodgy supplements to buff up. Practicing delayed gratification by being focused on the end goal while breaking the journey down into milestones and making a plan on how to deal with temptation will make us more balanced and mentally robust individuals. Don't forget to check out Audible using the link in the description to get this book for free. I personally think audiobooks are the best investment you can make because just one book can completely change your life. Check out the new Always Improving merchandise to help support the channel. We have some new designs which relate to various self-improvement concepts.